This is part two of the skeletal tissue lecture um, with regards to bone tissue. So we talked last time about the various types of the various bone tissues. So now let's look at bone formation. First of all, we have osteogenesis or ossification. Um, this is going to be the process by which bone forms. And bone is going to form in four different situations. <clears throat> The first being during embryological and fetal development. The next being when bones are going to grow before in adulthood, like when you're growing taller as, as you grow. Um, then also as bones remodel, and then bones are going to also, excuse me, and then when fractures heal. All these are going to be situations in which bone is going to form. So bone formation is termed osteogenesis also called ossification, and this is going to begin when embryonic mesenchymal cells are going to provide the template um, for the subsequent ossification. And there are two types of ossification that can occur. First, we have our intramembranous ossification, and this is the um, going to be when the formation of bone directly is going to form or within a fibrous connective tissue membrane. Next, we have our endochondrial ossification, and this is going to be the formation of bone from a hyaline uh, cartilage models. So, looking at the steps for intramembranous ossification, these are going. To, this is going to occur in flat bones when a connective tissue membrane is going to be replaced by bone. So, the first step in this intramembranous ossification is the development of the ossification center. So, an ossification uh, ossification is going to form from those mesenchymal cells as they're converted from our osteoprogenitor cells into osteoblasts and are going to lay down that osteoid matrix, that bone matrix. The second step is calcification. This is when the matrix surrounds the cell and then calcifies as those osteoblasts become osteocytes. Our third step is the development of trabeculae. And this is going to be when the calcif um, calcifying matrix center uh, is going to join to form the bridges of those trabeculae that's going to make up spongy bone with the red bone marrow in between. And then our fourth step is going to be the development of the periosteum. This is the, um, so the periosteum is going to first form as a collar of spongy bone and is then going to be replaced by compact bone. There's a few more steps when we're talking about endo, uh, endochondrial ossification, however. This is going to be um, the type of bone formation that is going to replace cartilage with bone in the developing embryo or fetus. So the first step in endochondrial ossification is going to be the development of the cartilage model. This is when mesenchymal cells are going to develop into chondroblast which you're going to form into the, con the cartilage model. Um, the second step is the growth of that <clears throat> cartilage model. So growth in length, which is interstitial growth, and then growth in width, which is called appositional growth, is going to occur as those chondrocytes, as those cartilage cells divide. The next step is going to be the development of the primary ossification center. The, um, this primary ossification is going to proceed inward from the external surface of the bone and is going to, um, and this region that's forming is going to be the diaphysis. So the bone tissue is then going to, re uh, is going to be replaced, is going to replace most of that cartilage. Our fourth step is the development of the medullary cavity. Um, um, so a bone bone is going to be broken down by those osteoclasts to form our medullary cavity, that kind of empty or hollow space on the inside of that bone there. Um, the next step is the development of our secondary ossification center. Here you can see that there. These are going to occur in the epiphyseal, epiphysis of the bone, and they're not going to have any medullary cavity that's going to form there. And then our last but not least is the formation of the articular cartilage and the epiphyseal plate. Both of these structures are going to be consisting of hyaline cartilage, um, and these don't occur until adulthood. So let's look at how a bone is able to grow in length. 
Um, this endochondrial ossification is also going to occur in the epiphyseal plates of long bones as they grow in length. So this is how you're get growing taller. So to understand how the bone grows in length, you first need to know some details about that epiphyseal plate or that growth plate. The, so the epiphyseal plate is going to consist of four zones. All right, we've got our, um, our resting cartilage at this top zone. Then we have our zone of proliferation, proliferating cartilage. Then we have a zone of our hypertrophic cartilage and then the zone of calcified cartilage down here. So the activity of this epiphyseal plate is the only means by which the diaphysis is able to increase in length. So when the epiphyseal plate closes, it's going to be replaced by bone um, and that epiphyseal line is going to appear. And this is going to indicate that the bone has completed its growth in length. So you're not going to grow any taller or longer. <laughs> So, looking at growth in thickness then, um, bone can also grow in thickness or in diameter by appositional growth of, at, that's going to occur at the periosteum. Bone growth in diameter, in, as a bone is going to grow in diameter as a result of interstitial and appositional additions to the uh, new bone tissue by osteoclast, osteoblast. Excuse me. Um, so around, this is going to occur around the outer surface of the bone, as well as to a lesser extent on the internal bone. Um, this is going to dissolution by those osteoclasts in the bone cavity. All right. So looking at this growth in thickness, all right, first it starts with the ridges of the periosteum are going to create a groove um, in that periosteal blood for that periosteal blood vessel to reside. Next, that periosteal ridge is going to fuse and form that endosteum uh, lined um, tunnel. The third step is going to be when the osteoblasts um, in the endoderm are going to build new, um, uh, new concentric lamella moving inwards towards the center of the tunnel forming new osteons. And then the last step for growth in thickness or appositional growth is when the bone is going to grow outward as those osteoblasts in the periosteum build new circumferential lamella. The osteon formation is going to repeat as new um, as new periosteal ridges are going to fold over different, a new blood vessel. So the whole cycle will, will repeat itself. Also looking at growth in uh, thickness, bone thicken, bones are going to be able to thicken due to the cooperative actions of both osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So an osteoblast is going to deposit bone on the outer surface while the osteoclasts are going to widen that medullary cavity within All right, so that it can grow in, in, in thickness. Um, so in this way the medullary cavity is going to enlarge as the bone increases in thickness. Um, this is important, otherwise you would have a very small medullary cavity um, in adult bones. So we, we, need to, we need the cooperative action of the osteoclast to, keep, um, the, to continue to enlarge that medullary cavity as we grow. When we talk about remodeling of the bone, this is an important process in bone tissue maintenance and development. So remodeling is going to be the ongoing replacement of old bone tissue with new bone tissue. An old bone is going to constantly be destroyed by the osteoclasts. And then the new bone is going to be constructed by our osteoblasts. Um, so this whole process of, bone, of remodeling of the bone is going to involve two different things. We have bone resorption and bone deposition. Bone resorption is going to be the removal of minerals and collagen fibers from bone by osteoclasts. Bone deposition is going to be the addition of minerals and collagen fibers to the bones by osteoblasts. All right. So deposition, we're laying down bone. Bone resorption, we're breaking it down so that those minerals can be reabsorbed. There are going to be several factors that are going to impact um, growth of the bone as well as remodeling. All right, a big one is going to be ad adequate dietary intake of, of the various minerals and vitamins that are really necessary for the growth of bone as well as the maintenance of these bones. 
So things like calcium and phosphorus are going to be needed for bone growth in large concentrations. And then other minerals are also going to be needed, but in smaller amounts. So things like vitamin C, K, B12, and A are all going to be really important for bone growth to occur. Hormones are also going to play an important role in bone growth and remodeling. The most important hormones for stimulating bone growth during childhood are going to be insulin-like growth factor, which is going to be stimulated by human growth hormone. Um, so these are both going to be really important for um, allowing for appropriate growth and remodeling of the bone. Thyroid hormones and insulin are also going to be play an important role um, in the um, in bone growth. And at puberty, those sex hormones like and, or like estrogen and testosterone are also going to stimulate very sudden uh, growth. So you're going to get really, you're going to do a lot of growing. And they're also going to allow for modifications of the skeleton to create male versus female forms. Um, if you look in the book, you can see that table 6.2 has a table with more details in it. Um, that's just there if, if you you know, would like, if you have additional interest. So now we're going to look at the process of fracture and repair to bone. So looking at the process of fracture and bone repair, um, this is going to have four main, or, well, it's going to have three phases with four steps. Um, so a fracture is just going to be simply a break in the bone. The, so we're starting at looking at our various phases. The first phase is the reactive phase. This is going to be the early inflammatory phase, um, and this is when the fracture repair is going to involve the formation of a clot called a fracture hematoma, which you can see here. All right. This is going to take about six to eight hours after to form after that initial bone break happens. All right. Our second phase is going to be the reparative phase, which you can see here. Um, this is going to include the formation of the fibrocartilage um, fibrocartilaginous callus first, and then a bony callus is going to form second. Um, so the organization um, of the fracture hematoma is going to then develop into something called a granulation tissue. Uh, this is called a procallus. And this is going to subsequently be what's going to transform into our fibrocartilaginous callus or our soft callus. And this is going to take about three weeks to happen. Um, after that break. Next, the next step in our second phase um, is going to be the conversion of our fibrocartilaginous callus or our soft callus into the spongy bone of the hard callus, right, or the bony or hard callus. And this whole process of conversion here is going to take anywhere from three to four months to occur. And then our final phase um, in bone repair is going to be the bone remodeling phase. And this is going to be the last step as that bony callus is remodeled. And so remodeling of this callus is going to bring the bone back to its nearly original form. Um, you can see it is not quite the same though. But there is always going to be, an, um, you will always be able to detect um, that, that previous break there. So now that we've discussed the how fracture um, repair occurs, let's look at a couple of different kinds of fractures. The first one is the open or compound fracture. This is the when the broken ends of the bone are going to protrude through the skin. And conversely, a simple or a closed fracture is not going to break through the skin. Um, so the bone's still broken no matter what, but it's compound or open if your bone is sticking out. Um, so that's kind of gnarly. Next, we have a commuted, um, a commuted fracture. This is when the bone is splintered or crushed um, or broken into little pieces at the site of impact. And those smaller, phone, uh, excuse me, those smaller bone fragments um, are going to lie between the two main um, fragments of, of the main part of the bone. Um, this is a nasty one, and it's going to involve a lot of pins and screws and metal plating to put that shit back together. Um, so that's a real bummer. Um, and yeah, that's a commuted fracture. Next, we have the green stick fracture, and this is an interesting one. Um, so this is a partial fracture in which one side of the bone is going to be broken and the other side is going to bend. 
So this is going to be kind of like when you have like a green twig, like a young sappy, like sappy twig or whatever. Um, if you bend it, it's going to bend on one side and the other side is going to break, but it's not going to break all the way through. Um, so this is going to, uh, this type of fracture is going to occur only in children. And this is because those bones have not yet fully ossified. And so they're going to contain more of the organic uh, materials than the inorganic materials than what you would see in an adult. So you can see how this one is, um, it's broken on this one side here, but it's just bent on the other. And this, so this, yeah. And so like I said, this only happens in kids because um, they're just a little bit more bendy. They're not quite done ossific ossificating yet. Um, so they're still a little bit more bendy. This is a green stick fracture. And then next we have our impacted fracture. This is kind of a gross one. Um, this is when one end of the fractured bone is going to be forcefully driven into the anterior of the other bone. So you can see how it's just been driven up and like crunched into the upper side of that bone there. Another nasty one. Next we have a pot fracture. And this is going to be a fracture of the distal end of the lateral bone of the leg. So aka the fibula. Um, and this is going to have serious, also correspond with serious injury to the distal tibia um, articulations there. So this is in the ankle. Um, this is a nasty one. And then in a similar kind of fracture, but occurring in the wrist, is called a Coles fracture. This is a fracture to the distal end of the lateral forearm bone, a.k.a. the radius, um, in which the distal fragments are going to, dis it's going to be displaced posteriorly. Um, if you look this up on the internet, it's got some crazy people, um, got some crazy images if you check any of these out on, um, like on the Google. So... You know, if you've got this limit for it, check it out, because it's, it's some crazy stuff. So, next, we need to talk about the bone's role in calcium homeostasis, because we mentioned that that is a major function of um, bone tissue in the body, is to help to maintain calcium homeostasis. Oops, wrong way. So, as with most things, there is a negative feedback loop that's going to be used um, to maintain this calcium homeostasis. So bone is going to be responsible for storing about 99% of the body's calcium. And the parathyroid gland is going to secrete parathyroid hormone um, when calcium levels drop. Right? So the osteoblasts are then going to be stimulated by this parathyroid hormone to increase bone resorption and calcium is going to be released. Our parathyroid hormone is also going to stimulate the production of something called calcitrol by the kidneys, and this is going to increase calcium absorption in the intestines, all right? So just looking at this, our feedback loop here, same stuff, just in different form, um, we can see our stimulus is going to be some sort of disruption um, in calcium homeostasis by a decrease in our, con or a change in our controlled condition. So in this case, we're having a decrease in blood calcium levels, all right? The receptor for our feedback loop here is going to be the parathyroid cells. These are the cells that are going to be involved in detecting um, that calcium concentration, that decrease in calcium concentration. And when they detect this, it's going to trigger the production of something called cyclic A and P. All right? um, this is going to trigger our control center, the parathyroid hormone gene, um, to essentially turn on, if you will, or um, increase production. Um, or the release of parathyroid hormone, right? That's our output. This is going to trigger our effector cells, um, i.e. the osteoclasts or the kidneys. The osteoclasts are going to increase bone resorption, so they're going to carve out more bone so that more calcium can circulate. And the kidneys are going to start to hold on to and retain the calcium in the blood um, as well as, and then also excrete the phosphate in the urine, and as well as producing calcitrol. And all of these things are going to lead to an increase in our blood calcium levels. Once the calcium levels have increased enough to return to homeostasis, then um, the response is going to bring, uh, so this is going to cause an end, or it's going to bring things back to homeostatic conditions, and so we're not going to need to produce, to continue to produce parathyroid hormone. So that's how the bone is going to be involved in regulating calcium homeostasis, which is a very important, um, calcium is very important in the body for a, a several different things, which we'll talk about later in the semester. So 
Um, we all know that exercising is important, um, but it's also um, exercising is also really important for maintaining good bone health, especially as we age. So within limits, bone is going to have the ability to alter its strength in response to various mechanical stresses by increasing the deposition of mineral salts as well as the production of collagen fibers. So the removal of any of these mechanical stresses is going to cause the bones to weaken, um, and this is due to demineralization, which is the loss of those bone minerals, um, as well as collagen reduction. So th weight bearing activities, things like walking or moderate weight lifting, are going to be really important in helping to maintain bone mass, especially as you age. Um, this is particularly important in um, postmenopausal um, or menopausal women um, who are going to be at greater risk of osteoporosis, so maintaining these weight bearing activities um, are going to be very important to help to maintain and retain bone mass. So, looking at how bone, bones change as we age, so from birth through adolescence, there's going to be more bone that's produced um, than there's going to be bone that's lost during remodeling. This makes sense because we're still growing, we're getting taller, we're getting, those bones are getting thicker, heavier. Um, as an adult, however, the rate is going to be about the same, so our bone resorption versus our bone deposition is going to be about equal. And then in older individuals, especially those postmenopausal women, like we mentioned, um, are going to experience a decrease in bone mass when resorption is going to outpace deposition. So the loss of bone mass is going to result from demineralization, and this is the loss of calcium and the various other minerals um, from the bone's extracellular matrix. So that is all we have to cover for um, the actual bone tissue. We do need to take a quick look at a couple of different um, bone surface markings, though. Um, this is important to know when we, for when we start to work on identifying actual bones in the lab. Um, so, bone surface markings are going to, um, to be very important uh, as far as identification purposes are concerned, um, as well as functionally. Um, bones are going to have characteristic surface markings. These are structural features that are adapted for specific functions. Um, there are two major types of surface markings. We've got our depressions and our openings. These are going to allow for the passage of soft tissue as well as form joints. And then we also have processes or processes, sorry. Um, and these are going to be projections or outgrowths that are going to form joints as well. And they're also going to serve as an attachment point for ligaments and tendons. So here's a table that's going to just basically summarize all of the different types of bone markings. Um, the various bone markings that we're going to cover. This one is looking at the various types of depressions and openings um, that are going to be sites where they're, they're going to allow for the passage of soft tissue, i.e. nerves, blood vessels, ligaments, etc. Um, and these are also going to potentially form depressions. And so we're going to go through and look at each of these and then examples of them as well. So first we have the fissure, right? This is a narrow slit that's going to be between two bones um, that's going to serve as a passage for blood vessels or nerves. And you can see here we've got our superior orbital fissure that's going to allow for the um, ocular nerves to reach from the eyeball into the brain. Next we have the foramen. This is a hole for passage of blood vessels as well as nerves and ligaments. And here we have a really big one. This is a foramen magnum. This is where your um, brain stem is going to kind of leave the head and become the leave the cranium and become the spinal cord. Alright, next we have the fossa. Um, this is going to be a shallow depression. Here you can see the mandibular fossa. This is where that lower jawbone, that mandible, um, is going to attach to, is going to sit and kind of attach to your head. This is what, where your jawbone connects to your head. And then next we have the sulcus. This is going to be a a furrow in a bone. This is going to be for the passage of a blood vessel as well as tendons or a nerve. Um, we'll check that one out and we'll come back to that one. And then we also have the meatus, and this is going to be a tube like opening. Here you can see the auditory or the external auditory meatus. Um, this is where your this is what's going where your ears would sit essentially. So this is allowing for the passage of the um, the those auditory nerves to reach the brain. All right. So those are our, those are our depressions. Um, 
next we have the various types of processes. These are going to be projections or outgrowths of the bone that are going to form joints or attached to points for connective tissue um, or attachment points for connective tissue, things like ligaments and tendons. So here's a little table for studying purposes and then moving forward we've got first type of um, process that we have is the condyle. This is going to be a round uh, rounded projection with a smooth articular surface. Right? So here we can see our occipital condyle. Um, next we have the facet. This is going to be a smooth, flat, and slightly concaved articular surface um, where so it's going to form a joint. And here we've got our superior articular facet. Next we have the head. Um, and this is usually going to be a rounded projection, um, a, a rounded articular process that's going to support, um, be supported on a neck. So um, they show you here the, the, the head of, the, of a rib along with the neck. Um, it's really apparent um, in the femur um, where we see the femoral head and then the femoral neck right here. Right. Um, next we have the crest. This is going to be a predominant ridge or elongated process. Here we can see our medial sacral crest. Um, and then the epicondyle is usually going to be a roughened projection on a condyle. Um, this is going to be a really great place for um, ligament attachment, essentially. Um, and then we also have a line. This is going to be a narrow, long, narrow ridge or a border. It's going to be just a little bit less prominent than a crest, but it's similar, but just less prominent. And then um, we have a spinous process. This is going to be a sharp, slender projection. We've got a great example of this with our uh, vertebra right there, with our spinous process. And then next we have the trochanter. Um, this is going to be a very large projection that's found only on the femur. Um, so we've got, this is where we're going to have a lot of, of muscle attachments, etc. We've got a greater trochanter and a lesser trochanter. There are also going to be something called tubercles, and these are going to vary in size, but there are just basically going to be rounded projections. And we can see here, we can see the tubercle of the rib. And then last but not least, we have the tuberosities. These are also going to be variable in size, and they're going to be projections with rough, bumpy surfaces. So here you can see our sacral tuberosity. Again, great place for um, connective tissue to attach. So that is the end of the lecture on um, the, that is that wraps up our lecture for the, uh, the skeletal system. So as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me um, or ask questions in class. So, great.